Hi, everybody. Um, welcome if you're joining us here in person at Puppetry Arts Center Petoskey, or hello on Zoom or Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for Coffee at 10 with Puppetry Arts Center. Um, many of you are familiar faces now. You've been joining us um, sometimes weekly for the programs we've been offering uh, in conjunction with our exhibition, Kindred, Traditional Arts of the Little Traverse Bay Dance of Odawa Indians. We go ahead and pretty safely distance. I'm going to go ahead and take this now. Uh, this exhibition has been a true delight to offer to our community. It has been open since, since September 20th, and it will run through Saturday, November 27th. Each week during the run of the show, we have invited Native artists, experts on traditional art, um, and historians to speak with us um, in connection with the show. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check, all, uh, check out all of our previous events, you can find them in recorded form on our website or through the videos on Facebook. Uh, today, we are virtual as well, so we will be recording this presentation. And you'll be able to see it on that Facebook page or our website once we have the chance to manually upload it. So give us a little bit of time on that. Um, this show has been a true joy to bring to the community. Um, I've been really thrilled to partner with uh, co-curator Eric Hemingway and many, many others who made it possible. Um, and this is our final Coffee at 10 um, for the exhibition. And I am completely delighted that our final speaker is none other than Frank Edomishek. Um, I have not had many conversations with Frank, um, but through the few that I have had, um, I have to say that I am moved and inspired every time I have the opportunity to hear his story. There are a few people that I have met in my life who somehow feel like they managed to fit like four or five lifetimes into one. Um, there are so many avenues <laughs> that Frank can, can expound on all in very thoughtful, very thorough, and very knowledgeable ways. So today's presentation will touch on just a few of the areas that um, Frank has delved into, um, and it will be a, a true opportunity to get to know him as an artist, um, but also hear about his passion and skill in fighting for the environment through policy and governmental work. So, um, Frank Edwigishik serves as Executive Director of the United Tribes of Michigan and was chosen by the Native Nations Institute to serve as, an, as its 2010 Indigenous Leadership Fellow. Frank also is an expert in traditional woodland Indian pottery and is credited with reviving the craft as a contemporary art form in his and other Native communities. Um, I guess. With that. I should also acknowledge that Frank was also the, the chair of our board at one time and almost single-handedly kept the Art and Craft Trail brochure alive and has been an advocate, advocate for arts throughout Northern Michigan um, for many, many years. So with that, please join me in welcoming Frank to the stage for which he is familiar and um, we'll welcome Frank. I said hello. Uh, the Sparrowhawk is the mark of my clan. I live here in the land of the crooked tree, and my spirit name is Noonday, otherwise known as Frank Uh My wife would say my my taxpayer name is Frank Edowakishik. <laughs> but uh, I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased to be able to be here. It's been a long time since I've been here uh, for a presentation. This, uh, um, I just returned from from Glasgow, Scotland, where I was uh, spent three weeks at the COP26, the climate change talks. So I'll touch on that briefly, and uh, and pretty much open to questions from folks. I know that I welcome all the folks here that are in the auditorium and all those that are watching or will be watching the recorded version of this. Uh, because, you know, a speaker is totally and completely incomplete without an audience. 
So you are every bit as important to this as I am. And that's something that I learned a long time ago, that, that these things happen because we're all together. And so there is time for interaction. And if you have questions, please feel free to, to raise them. We do have some specific time at the end for some discussion. But uh, in the, you know, if there's a burning question right in the middle of things, I don't mind if you if you interrupt and ask about it, because it may mean that I'm not being clear enough about something. So I want to talk about first is what moves us. What are the things that we do in, in every day? What I have on the screen right now, the picture of the ceremonial lodge we have at our property. And I walked out the door one day, and there was this rainbow a double rainbow, and it wasn't a regular rainbow. It was sort of pink and red, and it was different colors. It was at near sunset. And it's just been such an inspirational picture to me. I often will use that in, in a presentation like this. Because without that spirit, without that, that, that deep relationship that we have with the natural world, all of these things that we do would just be a shadow of themselves or might not occur at all. And it's that understanding of how we fit in our own spirituality, however we approach the creator in our own hearts and minds. But it's that respect, it's that feeling that we have that's so important. So I wanted to start out with that. And let's see, I haven't used this clicker yet, but I'm assuming that the arrows Will tell me which way to go. I'm assuming wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Egan can uh, advance them for you if that clicker's not working. Yeah, this isn't working right now, so let's go one slide. Uh, on my computer, if you just hit the space bar, it'll move. <laughs> I think that we need to talk more about this. What do you think? <laughs> so what's going on? It's advancing on our computer, but not on your perspective. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, what I would have told you had the next slide popped up <laughs> is. Uh, that the primary topic today will be one on the woodland Indian pottery that I do. You see some examples here, pictures here. There's some more pictures that we have out in the gallery. And this is the work that I did that was that, uh, that Liz mentioned. And uh, so we got a tour through the internet, through the. <laughs> Go. There we are. Very good. So, this is a pot that I made that's, that was purchased and it's at the in, in Chicago at the museum down there. The, uh, it's the, they didn't have one of my pieces, they have all kinds of other pieces there. But uh, I, I this ended up there, one of our customers in, in, down at our gallery in Carlin, Michigan, south of Traverse City, purchased this to go there. Uh, so this I started out because it's a really good example of the work showing the, the work around the rim and the punctate decoration that I do. That is, it's called because you puncture the pot, that's it's called punctate decoration, where I use the stick the end of a stick to do that. And then all the, the, the cord marking or the, the texture on the pot comes from being paddled with a paddle that's wrapped with cord made from basswood bark. So, of course, this all starts out with having material, clay. And so I will dig clay and also I gather stone, uh, a type of granite that, that uh, 
has weathered to the point where it just crumbles. If you if you reach out to pick it up, it'll crumble into your fingers. Almost everybody's had that experience at some time, picking up a stone. Well, that is really the that's the kind of stone that I need to use to mix some of that stone with the clay and the water to make the clay body that I use. And the clay, uh, when we gather the stone and the clay, we have grind it. Uh, these are old pictures. This is my 42-year-old son, <laughs> Joseph, grinding, using the grindstones that we use when we process the clay and the granite to get it ready to mix, to make the pots. This slide, the text, I don't expect you to be able to read, but on this slide, it shows digging the clay and then making the pot by the, the pinch pot form that I use when I do almost all the pots are made pinch pots or pinched and coiled. The paddling at the top that puts that texture on the pot that also helps shape it. And then the picture of the fire, where it's where we actually do the firing. Here's getting ready to do a fire. And what I do is the pots are made and then dried. What you have to understand, clay is a hybrided silica aluminum, meaning it's, you know, it's got it's silica and aluminum and and it's got chemically bound water in it. And to fire, you have to drive out that hit a heat at above 900 degrees Fahrenheit to drive out the chemically bound water. And when you do that, of course, it leaves a steam. And so often I'll take a picture just before a firing because in many cases, this is the last time I will see the pots because they will blow up during the firing. I blew up hundreds of pots as I was getting started learning how to do this process. Eventually, I got down to where I blow a few up now, now, now and then. But usually I can get through it. But the point is that the pots are put in, I can put them on, on a bed of straw or leaves or some, uh, some material of sorts. And then I'll put the pots in and then they're covered with a mound of sticks and, and wood that sort of looks like a muskrat house or something. And you can see here, we're getting ready to, to, to loading the fire, putting the wood on the fire. And, uh, and in this slide, we've now lit it. I usually light it from three different corners, so the fire will burn towards the middle. And the reason I do that is because that clay, as it's heating up, that clay has to heat evenly. If one side of the pot heats before the other side heats, there's a thing called the alpha beta quartz change that happens right around 900 degrees or so. And what that is, is the pot will be hotter and hotter and hotter, and then it'll suddenly expand. And it stays in that expanded form until it cools. And then when it cools, it also changes fairly suddenly. And if one half of the pot is hot and the other one isn't, when it changes, it can crack the pot in half. Or just put cracks or some other way damage it. So I like the fire from three corners, so it'll burn together. I also have quite a bit of wood on there. And the reason the wood, if you notice, the wood is all pretty small. I don't put big hunks of wood, big pieces of firewood. Of course, there's a reason for that, because that wood is all above the pots. And as the fire burns, those big pieces would fall and crush the pottery. So I use the small stuff that just settles. And this... Uh, what I burn usually is, is a softwood. Uh, my preference is to use poplar. Uh, it burns fairly quickly and it burns to a fine ash. It settles right out. And so you can, the, if you use a, even small sticks of say ironwood or something, if you used ironwood, the fire would still be there three days later. It takes a long time for some woods to burn, but I want a wood that's going to burn fairly quickly at these fires. And, Here's a picture of a, that towards the end of a firing. And you can see here that there's um, some of the pots are sticking up out of the ashes. And you notice that they're, they're lighter in color. Where they've been buried in the ashes, they will actually turn black. Some people think the black on these pots is actually carbon and it'll rub off or something. But there's a mechanism in this. I'm using red clay or clay that's, that's a colored clay, it's not a white clay. And what it happens is, is that clay has a lot of iron oxide in it. 
And when you have a fire, you're just real hot in that fire. The, it really, everything in there really wants to burn real bad. And what I mean by that is that it really wants to combine with oxygen. It's rapid oxidation is what a fire is. And so if you have a pot upside down that's sitting on leaves or straw, that little bit of oxygen that's inside the pot or around the rim that's buried in the ashes, what will happen is, is that it gets really hot and that it just really, the, the fire really wants to burn. And what it'll do is it'll reach right in the wall of the pot and grab some of the oxygen away from the iron oxygen and pull that oxygen out and leave a little speck of black iron. So the black in the pot is actually iron or other, the other minerals that do the same thing. So what that is, <clears throat> The interplay on the color of the pots that I do, as you can see, I have a bunch of them that I can talk a little more about in a minute. But that interplay is between oxidation and reduction. Now, it sounds like I know a lot about chemistry, but I'll tell you, when I went to the University of Michigan, took the placement exam for chemistry, got zero percentile. <laughs> uh, and it's because in my high school, we didn't have to memorize formulas. And apparently that was a requirement for the placement <laughs> thing, so I didn't do very well. But the point is, is that you don't have to be a chemical whiz to understand this. These are pretty basic, uh, basic concepts. But that play interplay between oxidation and reduction, the oxidation, you'll get the lighter colors. Reduction, you get darker colors all the way to just complete black. And usually the inside of my pots are black because the pots are fired upside down for the most part. And if I have a big pot, I can put a small pot upside down right in the middle of it, and the whole pot, that small pot, the whole one will turn black. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the mechanism in terms of coloration and firing. Uh, the fire, that, that alpha beta quartz change, you want to have enough wood on there so that there's enough ashes over the pots. So as they cool, they also cool at the same rate. They don't one part of them doesn't cool before the other. And so these are the things, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I don't stick a thermometer in there <laughs> to figure out what the temperature is. But 900 degrees, is if you have a wood stove at home, you got a pipe coming up out of your stove. And you look at the pipe and you think, gee, is that going? I'm not sure if it's going or not. That's 900 degrees, <laughs> okay? I mean, it's right at that point. And then it gets hotter and you can actually get a, you know, the, the, you can tell by color. When I was in Scotland, I took a picture of a, of a, of a fellow named Lord Kelvin, who was a professor at Glasgow University for 53 years. You may know his name Kelvin because it's how we measure the, it's one of the, the it's, it was very involved in, in, uh, in understanding temperature. And so when you look at your, uh, uh, you buy a fluorescent light bulb, and a really bright one will be 2,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? In other words, it, it measures the, the color of the bulb by this measure that he did. And so when we're looking at a fire here, we can tell how hot the fire is by the color of the fire. And so for this, the pottery that I'm doing, we want to heat it up to about 14 to 1,500 degrees. Uh, and much hotter than that, and the clay that I'm using will melt and into a little puddle. You don't want that, okay? So you can only go so hot. Now, stoneware pottery, on the other hand, much of the pottery that's in the gallery, the stoneware pottery, is made with a, a clay that fires at about 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can actually take some of the clay that I use, the reddish clay, you can make a, a slip out of it, and put it in a thin film on the outside of a pot, another pot that you've thrown. When you heat it up, the stoneware pottery, the stoneware clay just firms up and becomes fire, but the other turns into glass and becomes the glaze on it. And all that can happen from just two types of clay. Many of you have seen those brown jugs at, at antiques shops. That brown glaze, that slip glaze that's on there is usually a, a clay that has a lot of impurities in it that melts so that it becomes glass. So all of this process and stuff that you have to understand <clears throat> Uh, some of this is stuff that I understand because of understanding the chemistry of the firing. But uh, my ancestors who made these pots 
They did it through experimentation and understanding what it was that it would take to do. And so the clays that they used were the ones that they could easily attain the temperatures to fire because they couldn't get to 2,400 degrees. You can't do that without a kiln, which is a box that accumulates heat faster than it dissipates it. Whereas in, a, in an open pit fire like this, you know, the maximum you can get is maybe, maybe 2,000 degrees in tiny little spots, but usually it's like 1,400 degrees, 1,500 degrees. And that's where the temperature is. So here's an example of what I've been talking about. You can see on this pot that the inside is black and on the outside it's black right at the rim, but then there's a couple spots. Those spots are called fire clouds because there's something leaning against it right there that, that just took all the oxygen, took all that oxygen right out of the clay and left that black spot. But the bulk of it was sort of in the air, was open, and that's why it's this lighter color. And we have little control over how that's going to happen. <clears throat> we might think that we have some control, but of course, the creator has a way of straightening you up about things like that. <laughs> so this uh, <clears throat> this particular pot right here, this one is in the um, it's in the Ethnographic Institute in Saint Petersburg, Russia. Uh, I attended. Uh, a number of Indian artists from Michigan went to Russia in 1989, and we had an, uh, an exhibit in the U.S. Ambassador's residence in the gallery there called Swaso House in Moscow. And then we also visited the, the Moscow Craft Museum. And then we spent, took a two-day trip to what was Leningrad at the time, uh, is now St. Petersburg. And uh, the museum was 275 years old then. Peter the Great founded it, the Ethnographic Institute, and they had it. We went there to visit, and this pot was donated to that museum for as part of their collection now. They have quite a large collection of North American Indian art there. Uh, back in the 1830s, uh, a promoter had gotten a bunch of Indian art together from across the United States and had. Uh, was touring Europe with it, and he wasn't a very good businessman, and he went bankrupt. And he sold his entire collection, and the Ethnographic Institute bought it. And so they have quite an extensive collection of, of North American Indian art in St. In, in Petersburg, Russia, including one of my pieces, which is nice. Too. And we went in to see this when we, when we went there to visit. This, of course, is 89, it's before Perestroika. It's just as things were starting to happen as well. The Soviet Union was still hadn't broken up yet. But we went into the, to the museum, and the director is this big, robust guy, bear of a man. And as we walked in, he goes, Welcome, my friends. I'm Estonian, not Russian. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of a precursor to what was going to happen down the road. But uh, you know, so we we had a, had a great had a great visit there. But this this spot is in that museum. Now the next group of pottery, these are all you can see them. Some of them might have life size pictures either on the stage or out in the out in the in the gallery, and they're um, but these are all life size photos of the pots that I have that are in the State Historical Museum in Lansing. Uh, so if you go just west of the Capitol, there's the big the state museum and library there, and these pots are in their, their walk of history right at the very beginning of that. I made them for the opening of that museum, and that was, uh, uh, I made them when in, in late, I think late 1988 is when I actually made these pots. But this is a, this is a pot called Saginaw Ware. Uh, they wanted me to make replicas, but as an artist, I really rebelled against making replicas. So what I did is I made pots that were similar in style and nature to the kinds that they wanted, and then I delivered them to them, had them praise them and say how wonderful they were before I told them that they weren't replicas. <laughs> <laughs> and I sold them at just a fraction of the cost of what I would have, what they'd be selling for today. Uh, you know, they were. 
um, but these are still on exhibit there. And just a couple of years ago, I had a chance to go and visit the pots for the first time with actually Olderman. They did a video of me talking about each of the pots, and now that video is, is in their archives there too. But that this pot would be from the Saginaw Valley era. It's from around 1200 or so. The style of work is around 1200 AD. This one is a style of work called Norton Zone Dentate. Uh, dentate, because each of those little lines of little dots that you see, they use what's called a they use what's called a dentate stamp. In this case, it's the edge of a clamshell that I had notched, make little notches in it, and each one was individually rolled like that to make all those little marks. It was quite painstaking to do it. And then this style of work is uh, zoned. It was dentate because of that. Zone because the decoration is in zones, and Norton because it came from the Norton Mounds area of Grand Rapids. Not because there was ever an Indian named Norton there. Okay. <laughs> but this is the um, this particular style dates from about 200 BC to 200 AD. It's one of the oldest styles and was quite ornate for its time. If you notice, they also come to, sort of come to a rounded point, so they're sitting on little rings. We would sit them in a hole in the ground or weave a ring like a donut of, of fiber of, of sticks or something, or else they'd be set with rock, three rocks, holding them up. And uh, they could be used in a fire to cook, or they could be used in storage or for ceremony of different sorts. But this is, uh, this is that style. This one is from very close to here. This is, uh, from this is from 1400 AD, this style. And this one is Mackinac ware. It came from a site, the Jungman site, of uh, the, 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 the inspiration for this pot came from there. And this is actually fairly large. Uh, this is a life size photo of that pot. Frank, so can you can, hold that up just a little more? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so this is a this is a large cooking vessel, and uh, and it's got a cross hashing decoration on it, the cord marking that you see, and then a texture on the rim. Now, this is one of the largest pots I've ever made, and once again, this is the life size photo of that one. Remember, this is fired in an open pit fire. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, this one is called Parker Festooned. Mm -hmm. And once again, there was no Indian named Parker, <laughs> but uh, it had to do with the person that who did the dig or the site. This is uh, from the, the Young site. It's now near Lapeer, Michigan. This style of work came from there. And once again, it's fairly late. It's in 12 to 1400 AD. And it's festooned because it has those nice little points and like garlands around it in terms of the way they did it. And the decoration on this one, the other ones have been punctate, where you press in the design or paddle of design. This particular one was a type of a type of decoration called stab and drag. So you take a a tool and you sort of stab it in the clay and then you drag forward and stab back, drag forward, stab back. And so all the decoration around the, around the rim up there is done in that style of work. Well, once again, with the edge of a, of a stick. And you just break a stick to this, you know, like the mark it makes and then you use it. I've got some sticks that I've been using for almost 20 years. I, I keep them around and use them time after time. And if, if they break a little bit, well, then I have a new tool. You know? <laughs> and so uh, it's the, the tools I use are pretty, uh, are very not, they're not sophisticated. They're things we can gather from the world. I tell people I can strip away all of the modern society from my, my mind and my life, walk into the woods, naked as it is, without any of that modern stuff with me. And I can come out with pots. Because I can make the fire, I can process the clay, I make all my tools. Everything is the way it would have been done, say, 500 years ago. 
with the exception that today, of course, I use plastic to keep my clay and I use a match to light the fire. And I do drive my car to go get the clay. But the point is, is that, that the, the methods that I use are methods that were that predate any, any uh, European technology or contact, actually, here in the Americas. So these are the pots my ancestors made. And when you look around at, at various village sites, there'll be 30, 40, 50, 60,000 little pieces of pottery that are at those sites. And one of the ways that they date the site is by what type of pottery they find at the sites. And so uh, the making of pottery here, it, would, it drifted very far away in our, in our minds. So much so that many of the older people I talked to said, well, we never made pots. But you know, the best clay is over here. <laughs> and, and well, we didn't ever do that, but this is how you make that cord, that string that you use for the paddles. So those types of things are still around. When I make the basswood bark cord that I use to draft the paddle and things, I'm using the genetic descendants of the same trees that my ancestors used when they were when they made those same tools. And so these are the kind of things where there's this time. Remember, I talked about spirit at the beginning. That I don't just make something that looks like the old pots. I actually took some of the old pots and ground them up and put them in some of those little pot shirts and ground them up and put them in almost like a sourdough starter or something. I wanted to have that spiritual connection with those people who made the pots before and continue to make them in that kind of tradition, that kind of respect for the natural world. So the work that, that I'm doing really has a connection. When I gather clay, I need tobacco, because if you take something from the earth, part of it is, to, is balance, you want to keep balance. So I leave something, when I, when I gather something or take it, I need tobacco for the wood. You know, when I leave tobacco where I'm going to do the fire, I thank Mother Earth for that spot where I'm going to be doing the fire. And once I light the fire, I burn a little tobacco and say a prayer. I hope they don't blow up, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's there's things like this that that that, that is that connection with with the natural world that is so so critical. So I've been talking again about spirit and what that means, and I've used this. The pottery making has been really important to me. I've done a lot of uh, art fairs, I've done shows and exhibits and other things to different places. But I started using more of my creative talents as a political leader. I became the chairman here at Little Travers. I was chairman for 14 years. And I was, uh, uh, I was using those talents in speech making and negotiating and in trying to work on rebuilding an administrative government from, our, from the roots of our traditional governments here. And so when, when we started, several of us were all involved together. When we started, we had $4,000 in the bank. We were not a member of the federally recognized tribal list. And we had no regular office. And you know, 15 years later, we had a $30 million annual budget. We had, uh, at the time, we had about 1,200 employees. And we had a health clinic a police department and a tribal court, and we've adopted our, our revised constitution that we operate under today. So we had this sort of huge growth, but that growth all was rooted in the spirit. It was rooted in the soil. It was rooted in, in the pottery. It was rooted in the, the porcupine quill work that some of the artists do, the relation with that porcupine and the birch tree and all that. It come together in that, in that art form. There's a canoe in here, Jimon, as we say, that uh, is uh, was, was also that relation with the natural world, because that's what we use. So to me, this is this led directly, artwork has led directly to my work in all of the other areas. Uh, some of the areas I work in are the World Intellectual Properties Organization in Geneva, where they're working on patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And they've been working for about 18 years now on a treaty, an international treaty. They don't seem to be an awful lot closer today than they were when they started. 
However, I'm part of the Indigenous Caucus there, which is like the Indigenous people that show up at these meetings. And we've been working to make sure that you understand this patents, trademarks, and copyrights are ephemeral. They, they protect indigenous, they, they protect knowledge for a short, short period of time. And then when, they, when they're done, they go away. Whatever they're protecting becomes part of the public domain. And so we find it unlikely and unwieldy and also not to our choice to use patents, trademarks, or copyrights to protect traditional knowledge, to protect our, our, our stories and our dance and all these other things, because we never intend that for to be part of the public domain. So we've had to negotiate special places in, within this negotiation there in the Geneva on how do we protect indigenous knowledge? And what is it that we do? Because sometimes people have patented something that we do and then told us we have to pay them if we use it anymore. That doesn't seem right, does it? <laughs> and so the, this is the kind of stuff that we've been working on, but it all comes directly out of this understanding of spirit, understanding of this relationship to that natural world. The, you know, I worked in, in the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Summit that you may have read about that happened in New York in, in September, and it was a three-day pre-summit that happened in Rome, Italy, that was virtually, I attended virtually. And uh, where we're talking about the relationship of indigenous, in, in my case, indigenous rights, small-scale fisheries, uh, and uh, protecting our, our, our seeds, our heritage seeds, and protecting our, our way of life, how we, how we have uh, uh, how we survived for so long. Uh, many of them are in the, in the desert. There are tribes that are growing corn that is drought resistant and are able to do that through much of the severest droughts. And meanwhile, all the farmers around them, like their farms are dried up and blown away. And so it's this knowledge of their relationship to the earth and those heritage seeds that is important for humanity. And so we're there trying to make sure that this message is out there. I just was on a webinar yesterday morning speaking about small scale fisheries and the importance of the fish to our people. And part of that is thinking about, and I have to tell this story, that when my ancestors reserved fishing rights, they didn't go down to the water and look out there and say, those are our fish. They reserved the right to fish. And what they meant by that is the right to sing for the fish, to dance for the fish, to pray for the fish, to catch and eat the fish, but to have a relationship with fish. And the real treaty right was not a property right, as the courts have recognized. The real treaty right is that relationship with fish. And so that's what we were working on preserving. Well, and there's a thing called the canons of construction that say the treaties are to be uh, interpreted the way the Indians would have understood them at the time. Well, we, did, we un didn't understand the fish's property. We understood the fish that they were our relatives. So when we reserved fishing right, we were reserving that relationship with those fish. And so the, uh, you know, this is important because that isn't just with fish, but that relationship is with the night sky. It's with the water and the, the rocks and the minerals and the land. It's with the, the, all the other animals and beings, the insects, everything that we share this natural world with, they're, they're all our relatives. We don't think of it as property. So that concept of thinking this versus the European version of thinking of property has been in collision ever since contact. And so part of our job in, in all of this is to try to help people understand this. So I was speaking with one of the, uh, when I was over at COP26, I think maybe it's time I, this is the basis of this balance. This is the basis of what we understand. And we think of it the east, south, west, and north. There are teachings in each of those directions. You know, the, the earth, fire, wind, and water, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, all these different things are in these four directions, and they're all part of what we would call 
call it the, some people call it the medicine wheel, but they're four direction teachings. And we can go to a ceremony and spend an entire day in just one direction, just talking about that. But these are, uh, this is part of that balance that I was talking about. Remember I left tobacco when I gathered some clay? Well, that's part of the, this come, that comes from these teachings here about always trying to be in balance. To be standing in the middle of the world, for instance, not be too far down in any one of these directions. And then we have here the seven grandfather teachings. And these teachings, once again, you spend an entire day or even a week talking about any one of these, what it means. But the one that I talk about the most is respect. Because we're taught that we're supposed to respect each other. We're supposed to respect the natural world. And we're supposed to respect all of those other beings that, that we share this world with. So whenever we do something that doesn't respect the water, for instance, by putting pollutants in that water, it harms our relatives, the fish, and all the other beings that live there. And ultimately, that harms us because we eat the fish. And so whenever we put pollution in the air, it harms the air. And that falls out, and it's mercury in the water and other things. But it also affects our breathing and our ability to function. And so this idea of respect, what got us into this huge thing that's going on within, within the world these days is lack of respect. That lack of respect has led us to all sorts of problems. And so this idea that we, that we are you know, guardians of and stewards of and protectors of the natural world, because we have an agreement, we call it like it's the original treaty, it's the agreement with creation, that it's going to take care of us, but we have to take care of it. It's a reciprocal relationship. And so based on that, I, we were talking with the, the environmental minister from one of the European countries, uh, who was one of the lead negotiators over at Glasgow, and we were talking about how we, you know, the indigenous people are protecting these things. And she said, well, you know, I, I really beg to differ with you, she said, because if indigenous people are protecting this, does that mean the rest of us have washed our hands in this? You know, that it really is an our responsibility. And I said, no. What happens is, as indigenous peoples, we're close to the earth. We understand this tie and understand these teachings. But I said, every one of us is indigenous to the earth. All of our cultures, in their roots, have the same idea of respect. And some cultures have drifted away, away from that. And as they drift away from that, they start making decisions that don't make sense because they're disrespecting things, but they think it's okay. You know, they, they, they say it's okay to do that because, well, we really need this. When it really, we don't need those things so much that, that cause those problems. So anyway, I said, no, I said, we're just trying to reawaken in you and all the others to share these teachings that come from all over the earth. Every one of us is indigenous to the earth. We're trying to reawaken those feelings within you to help focus and help you understand why it's important to make the decisions to help protect us through, through the, the climate negotiations that we were doing there. Frank, we're about 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. So here is a shot from there. I am, in this picture, I am singing a song as an invocation for a meeting with the cop president, who is from the United Kingdom. And the woman in white right here is Patricia Espinoza, who is the executive secretary of the secretariat that works. She's been there for at least 10 years now, doing, the, the, doing all the work of managing this huge meeting. There were 32,000 people that were badged, that had the barcode badges to get in, and uh, in the meetings. And in one of the rooms called the Action Center, they had this 60-foot globe hanging in, hanging up in the middle of the room. So people were taking their picture, holding the world up, you know. <laughs> and I have one with it on my head, you know. <laughs> but you can see what some of the things that, that were going on. And I just wanted to show a picture of this. And this is one of the big rooms where the decisions are being made, where, they, where they're reporting out and doing this. These rooms are huge, and 
there's a, I'm actually in the overflow room. The room with all the ministers in it was equally large, but there wasn't room in there. So we were in the overflow room in this room where they were broadcasting live what was going on in the other room. These meetings are huge. They take a lot of work. There's a lot of compromise. But we managed to get human rights and the rights of indigenous peoples in the operative parts of the agreement that came from there. And we also managed to get it in the operationalized. So it's actually part of the operational part of the text. These were some of the things we did. And the biggest thing that happened at Glasgow is that we managed to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius in sight. And what that means is, is from pre uh, from pre industrial times till now, we have risen about 1.1 degrees Celsius. And the goal at Paris was well under two degrees with 1.5 in mind. At 1.5, even at 1.5, we're going to lose perhaps the subways in New York unless they figure out how to keep them from flooding. We're going to lose part of Louisiana. Mar-a-Lago is going to cease to exist from heavy water. I mean, we're going to lose a lot of the country. We're going to have climate, you know, we're going to have climate refugees, even in the United States and other places. So some places, I think the, the Maldives, for instance, are likely to cease to exist. You know, that one of the, the ministers from there said the difference between 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius is a death sentence for my country and my people because I'll be underwater. And there's a lot of things that were around the world. So there's some real heavy thought here. And it all comes down to that idea of learning to respect and to work with each other. And so, we're back to the whole concept of spirit and how all this stuff ties together. So I'm, I'm open for some questions that people have them now. And, uh, I'd be glad to, to address any, and I don't know if we have any that come offline. If we do, you could share that with me. Yeah, we've got a couple from online. I'll, I'll share them now, and then um, if you've got questions, think about them and, and raise your hands. Uh, Ken Winter wants to say hello from his NCMC class. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, they, they have a class question. They're wondering, how did you learn about some of the pottery designs from 500 years ago? I went to museums and I studied old pottery. And I studied the collection and I had to argue with the anthropologist and said, well, this is how this was made. And I studied it for a while. And I said, well, that's impossible. It couldn't have been made that way. It was made this way. And I showed them. I made the tool and showed them how to do it. So in many cases, I added to some people's knowledge in doing it. But I studied museum collections all over the Midwest to, to learn the design. Thank you. Uh, and Renee Dillard says, you are one of the few people who can bring tears to my eyes when you explain reciprocal relationship Anishinaabek have with the environment, she uh -huh. And she says, were the pot types with the turned out lip edge suggesting a way to carry or cook? Can you talk about maybe how that form is dictating function there that you've noticed? Um, I can't really, uh, I don't really talk about that other than, than I think that to the extent that when they have that turned out lip, it makes it stronger at the lip because it's not, if it's just straight up, it's, it's not as strong. But if it has that little bend in it or it actually comes out a little, I think it makes the pot stronger. And, and the thing, the other thing is we have to make sure that the pot is thermal shock resistant. So we have to make the clay body in a way that it will be, that you can actually cook in them. And so you have, they have to be able to withstand that heat from the fire. Not to fire it, but just to heat liquid in it, for instance. Thank you. And one last online comment, but go ahead, those of you online, go ahead and feed your questions in here. But there's a hello from Tanya and Tim Carlson at Northwestern Michigan Artists and Craftsmen. Uh, the voices from the past. It's great <laughs> to hear you. <laughs> Are there other questions here in house? Daryl? Hi, my name is Daryl. Nice to meet you. Um, I read a, a paper uh, from one of these climate summits. A woman was studying indigenous people of South America. And this area of South America, every clan had a coffee tree. And she was saying that 
that's sustainable and plantations are not sustainable? Well, uh, I've seen posters at the COPS. COP is Council of the Parties. This was number 26. Uh, you know, so um, the um, COP 21 was the one in Paris with the Paris Accord was done. The uh, um, a plantation is not a forest. That's a that's a statement that's often made. And you know, what that means is, is that the trees grow around each other and help each other and support each other. But when you get rid of all of the different species and you just plant one kind, they don't have that, that strength from each other. And it, they end up not being as healthy. They require more fertilizer and more chemical pesticides and things of this sort. And so it becomes less, um, we were talking about coffee earlier, it's just starting here, that the idea that uh, there's shade grown coffee that is grown with other species that is a sustainable harvest. And then there's the plantation coffee. I advise giving this the shade grown, mostly because it's more indigenous and and it's I, I believe it's a lot healthier for us. But I think those are the kind of things we have to work to try to preserve. And we just like if you read Finding the Mother Tree, which is out there right now, it's a great book talking about the relationships between trees, how they take care of each other and help each other. That 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 will be true for our, our food crops or any of the, the tree crops and all these others. The other thing to think about, people think of, say, the Amazon as being uh, just a natural, it's just that naturally that way. But it's actually a built environment because the people that live there planted a lot of the things near where they walk or where they go so that they have their food trees and other things there. So you find clusters of these things throughout there that don't really make sense if it was just a, a wide open natural forest. So it's already been modified to some extent that by us planting things. So anyway, that's but I, as far as the, the trees go, uh, I have friends that, that import uh, the uh, indigenously harvest uh, shade grown coffee and they say it is way better than the other stuff. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? I can't see very well. Way in the back. Yeah. Okay. So, go ahead. Frank, thank you so much for comments on respect and um, the recognition of all people that is as indigenous to the earth. I hadn't thought about that before. So, thank you for those comments and sharing some ways we can be better consumers and being aware of how we can help protect the earth. What's one thing in our own environment in this particular part of Michigan that you would like to see? people being aware of and working toward. Well, I guess the first thing, I'm going to back up a little and say, the way the Paris Accord works is every country comes up with an NDC, a nationally determined contribution. And if those NDCs, they make, if they're ambitious enough and you aggregate all of those from all the countries in the world, you're going to end up with that, if in theory, that should keep the temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, right now, the ambition is not quite high enough, and they're still working on trying to get it down. I think one of the estimates was we have about 1.8 right now. Uh, but um, so those it, within that, there's a lot of different things that they count. But I came up with this idea that, say, in our tribe here, uh, in 12 years, through efficiencies, almost entirely through efficiencies, and turning the changing light bulbs and motors and fans and other types of things, things that we've done. In 12 years, we saved just shy of 100,000 metric tons of carbon. Now that's a small amount when you think about what it is, but it's a 5,000 member tribe with only one facility that we've been able to do that with. If you aggregate all of those across all of the tribes, it's a big deal. And so there's this, what's called, an, I'm calling it an IDC, an indigenously determined contribution. And we're trying to get that, to all the different indigenous peoples to do, to, to actually calculate what they've been doing so that they can put it into a form like this. But I think the thing that, that sort of led me to what this is, I've also come up with a concept called a PDC, a personally determined contribution. 
What does that mean? It means that you maybe walk to the store instead of drive, or you, you uh, take the stairs instead of the elevator, or you uh, turn the lights out and go to bed at 9.30 at night when it gets dark instead of, <laughs> instead of trying to stay up all night and burn, burn off electricity. In other words, there's all kinds of things that every individual can do that helps. And it, this is a personal thing. That, you know, uh, years ago in about water, I talked about making sure when you brush your teeth, you turn the water off. That was in saving groundwater. But it also saves power because that water is pumped and it has to be processed for what it means to municipal systems. And so that's another thing that every person can do that will help. And ultimately, we each have to do that. We have to decide that we're going to buy a hybrid or an electric car, even if it's a little inconvenient, because we have to stop burning fossil fuels. Next, we've got to lessen the burning of fossil fuels. And uh, anything that we do, like offsets, different sorts, that, that they, but they don't actually result in burning less fossil fuel. They just tell it, the company can stand up and say, hi, we're net zero. We're net zero because we bought all these offsets and now we can keep on using the same amount of power we always use. And what that does is it means that, that we're not really getting to the heart of the problem, which is uh, reducing the reliance on and the burning of fossil fuels. Because if you think about it, those fossil fuels are 65 to 300 million years old. They've been in the ground. As long as human beings have walked on the earth, they've been in the ground. And we're taking them out and burning them and putting them back in the air. And that's what the real issue is when it comes to this. So what would I like to see? I'd like to see a network of charging stations from across the state that anybody could go for a drive and everybody could charge their cars. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see people, when someone's running for, for office, I'd like everybody here to say, are you going to support this? You want my vote? This is what it's going to take to do these kinds of things, to do these things that are going to help us move along towards a, a healthy future for those coming generations. Uh, you know, I'd like my grandchildren's grandchildren to be able to live in peace and have, have a healthy world. And one of the people, the vice president of the European Union spoke, he held up a picture of his grandchild at COP26 and he said, I have to, I got to be able to tell him that I did something here. And what we do here today, he said, it means that when he's in his 30s and 40s, he will either be living in a world that's peaceful or he'll be at war fighting constantly over limited resources and other things. And so what is it that we're going to do? How are we going to, how are we going to move beyond that? And I maintain that what that is is by regaining and showing respect for all of the natural world and everyone and everything that's in it. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's still um, pastries and coffee. So if you have some more questions that you want to ask, um, Frank will be here for a couple more minutes. Um, take some time to walk through the galleries and take a look at his pieces and all of the wonderful work that we have on display. And as we come to a close, I just want to say thank you again for joining us here in person. And I'm probably out of the camera in Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and then I thank our members for making these programs possible. I thank Roast and Toast for making this possible. They donate this coffee. I don't know about the source, but it is still very tasty. Um, I want to thank uh, Christie's uh, North Harbor Real Estate uh, as our exhibition underwriter, Odawa Casino for supporting this program, Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, the Toski Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation, Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, Michigan Humanities, and Women Who Care. All of these organizations, uh, along with many individuals, made today's program, this exhibition possible. And so I'm so thankful for our community um, for supporting the arts in that way. And then lastly, this is our final coffee at 10 for the series. Um, but many of you know that we had to reschedule Yvonne Walker Keshik's visit. Uh, that date has been set. She will be here at Crooked Tree Arts Center on the last day of the show. That's on November 27th. 
from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, she'll be working and you can stop by and see her at work and ask her questions. And, and that's always a magnificent experience. So thanks again for being here and thanks again, Frank.